Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And today we're diving into a significant shift that's happening in the world of XRP Ledger. It's the introduction of programmability. Now, if you've been following XRP, you might be surprised because David Schwartz, Ripple's chief cryptographer, has recently voiced support for adding programmability to the mainnet. But why this change of heart? The core reason? It's all about custom logic and developer demand. While the XRP Ledger's DEX and AMM are fantastic, the lack of the business logic that developers crave is missing. This limitation has slowed down feature development Take the AMM, for example, it took two years to build. Programmability could streamline this process going forward, allowing developers to innovate without stepping on each other's toes. Now, this doesn't mean the XRP Ledger is turning into an EVM chain, that's the Ethereum Virtual Machine chain, because the programming language, well, it has to be simpler more tailored to XRP's unique structure. However, this move acknowledges that while the ledger excels in certain areas, it needs programmability to truly compete. David's change of perspective came after discussions with many people, XRP Labs, Orchestra Finance, TQ in Japan, and yeah, they've been all looking at hooks, a form of a smart contract. Initially, there were concerns that David had about bloat and stability, but the consensus is shifting. Some programmability is better than none, especially when it's safe, small, and simple. But here's the catch. Once added, programmability is permanent. It's a big step, potentially risky, but necessary for growth. David isn't against smart contracts. He never was. He's just cautious about the trade-offs, especially storage, which wasn't a part of the XRP Ledger's original design. David says that he now admits they should have embraced this earlier. And while the AMM is great, this lack of integration with business logic making development challenging is something he'd like to overcome. XRPL Labs works on hooks and it's now live on Zahao. And yeah, it's impressive. And David thinks that it's functional and though it's not perfect, it's proving that maybe with careful steps, programmability can work on the XRP ledger and maybe it could be hooks. So I want you to listen to this just about 14 minutes of a discussion presentation that he gave in the beginning of his live space. And it's going to bring you up to speed on the transparency that's occurring. And really, it's a cry to the community to give feedback. All right, everybody, do enjoy. Uh, thanks for coming to this X space. This is the first X space I've ever hosted. Um, it was a little awkward getting it to work, but I think the guys yeah, can hear you. you can hear me. Yeah, it was a little awkward getting everything to work, but I think we got everything working now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Um, so with me today is Mayuka Badari, who's a senior software engineer at Ripple and Bias Goose, a developer advocate. Um, Hopefully they'll help me keep everything running smoothly today. We'll see how it goes. Um, so we're here today to discuss programmability on the XRP ledger. And um, some of the, basically my change in view and Ripple's sort of change in view. Um, we don't have a detailed proposal. I don't have one, Ripple doesn't have one. Um, we started talking to the community about our change in opinion, like the second it happened. And we wanted to get community input. Um, obviously, well, this is going to be, you know, a beginning and not an end. Um, and I want to explain why we thought programmability was important on the XRP Ledger mainnet, and um, and yeah, share just, just to share our thinking, so you knew where this. I know a lot of people felt like this came out of the blue, and, and it did. When you change, you know, when you when there's something changes, before it's one thing, after it's another thing, and so there's a change. 
So first of all, why programmability on the XRP ledger? I think the simplest explanation is, and it's pretty obvious, is permissionless customization. So developers can add custom business logic without needing entire network-wide approval as you would with amendments. Companies looking to build on chain have spoken to us and they've said that this would be very useful to him. It doesn't have to be um, a mind-bogglingly complex implementation. It doesn't, we don't have to turn the chain into you know, another EVM type chain. Um, but they would like to be able to distinguish um, their offerings from the other offerings on the ledger. You know, XRP Ledger has built-in native features like the DEX, um, you know, like issued assets, like the AMM, and you can do a significant fraction of want, what you would want to do really well and really easily. But you can't add any business logic at all to the ledger. Um, it's probably, you know, other than Bitcoin and maybe one or two others, it's probably the only major blockchain that's that limited in what customization you can do on chain. Also, developing new features for the XRP ledger is difficult. Um, the XRP ledger code base, just the way it's designed, it's just not very good to develop multiple major features at the same time. You can't really do rapid prototyping and deployment. Um, developers step on each other. And so the pace is slow. Like, like I would say we have probably a best in class AMM, but it took two years to develop and you couldn't really develop other features at the same time because it you know, ties into the payment engine and, and so on. Um, and so this will make it easier for contributions to come from people who are not you know, sophisticated C++ developers and don't understand you know, the complex construction of the XRP ledger software and they won't step on each other's toes. Um, It'll also, um, it'll also um, improve developer engagement. Um, they'll be able to use programming languages that you know, they're more familiar with. It won't be this, you know, this complex process that's, you know, it's just, it's just difficult for people. You, you can't easily like become an XRP Ledger developer where you can fairly easily um, develop you know, on top of um, some kind of programmability problem. Oh, by the way, you guys can, um, Submit questions uh, if you'd like, please. We we want that you know. I'm going to start with this introduction. We want you guys to, you know, to ask questions and contribute. So we have the EVM sidechain, which is being developed by PeerSyst and Axelar, and that will be a fully customizable environment that will be able to compete with EVM chains where somebody wants to build you know a fully custom solution or something that's just very complex. I'm, I I don't think that the XRP ledger is going to be able to compete in that ecosystem soon. I just, I don't think you can, you don't, you can't make one blockchain do everything. It just doesn't work that way. But I think we can, you know, we have the, we'll have the EVM sidechain to address people who know how to develop on an EVM platform or want to learn a skill that's, that's, that translates into other part, you know, into other ecosystems. So how did my thinking change? You know, there were a lot of conversations about smart contracts on the XRP ledger, mostly started by XRPL labs. Really, nobody was talking about smart contracts at layer one on the XRP ledger until XRPL labs brought it up. And, um, you know, um, I was somewhat skeptical. I was concerned about ledger bloat. I was concerned about performance. I was concerned about stability. And I think my main concern um, was mostly just that I didn't, I didn't, think that it was worth like if I, I felt that if we couldn't be competitive with like an EVM sidechain that there was no point. And I have to say my conversation with Bogato at Orchestra was definitely a, a turning point. I talked to Teku in Japan and and many others, uh, Adam, a lot of public comments about this. And what they convinced me of was two things. Number one, it's not all or nothing. It's not like we have to be the best blockchain for programmability for programmability to matter. We don't have to be suit competitive with, we don't have to have best in class programmability. It'd be great to, not that I wouldn't want to if we could, but the, the, what they convinced me of is that some programmability is better than no programmability. And what they also convinced me of is that we could, um, we could do something sort of that met three requirements, that it was safe, that it was small and simple and something that we could build off of and that it would allow useful useful uh, work immediately. So one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to introduce a feature to a blockchain that doesn't have any current use cases. You never want to do that. You don't want to add something like in case you need it later because you can't you can never you can basically never remove something from a blockchain. If we add an XRP ledger feature and the community accepts it, you can basically never remove it because you know, like people will be relying on it. You just, just you basically can't. And so if we add, if we add something 
we want to make sure that it's something that we can build off because basically we're going to have to, you know, it becomes a permanent feature. So I've become convinced that there is a solution and maybe it's hooks, maybe not, but I'm convinced that there is a solution that's small and safe, allows real world use cases and gives us a plat. If it works well, we can see what features people want and continue to build off it. If it works badly, you know, that would not be good, but it wouldn't be a disaster. We wouldn't have fundamentally changed the nature of the blockchain irreversibly and essentially broken it. Um, and that risk is significant, by the way. Um, you can break, you know, you can break a public blockchain and it can be quite challenging to sort of unbreak it. And so that is a real risk. And so we do have to be very careful that we do things in measured steps and, and that allow, you know, meaningful real world use cases. And I'm convinced that we can do that. I just want to say I've never been against programmability in the XRP ledger. Um, I just I just wasn't convinced that there was a solution that would, you know, not there's things we love about the ledger. We love its payments, we love its speed, we love its predictable transaction fees. Um, there's resource consumption issues, there's ledger space issues. And the big concern for me, <coughs> excuse me, was the trade-off with data storage. You know, we talked about this within the C team at Ripple. I think I I think I've talked about it publicly. Smart contracts are not useful if they can't store data. Um, you know, if you're going to build a smart contract, whatever it's going to do, if it's a derivatives market, if it's an auction, you know, whatever it is, if it's a synthetic stable coin, you know, algorithmically stabilized, whatever it is, um, it's got to store data about what it's doing. And the XRP ledger's data structures were never really designed to store smart contract data. And that's the, that's the big, that's the big trade-off. Um, I do think Ripple probably should have prioritized smart contracts at layer one sooner. Um, we didn't, we were, we were more skeptical. And I think the big thing that we missed was that, that, that we could, that small steps would be useful, that we didn't have to be the best platform for smart contracts. And it would, and people would still be able to use those smart contracts, both to, to distinguish their features, implement their business logic and to tie existing features together. You know, an AMM is great, but if it's not connected to anything else, it, it's not as great. It's nice to be able to sort of connect things together with business logic, distinguish functions, you know, because today developers, if they want to build in the XRP ledger space, they either have to build XRP ledger features, which has a massive barrier to entry and then, you know, get them accepted by amendment, which is you know extremely difficult. And it has to be something with mass appeal or basically all they can build are wallets and user interfaces. Now, wallets and user interfaces are important, but it's hard to build a business around a wallet or a user interface. And if you can distinguish your actual financial products on chain, that makes it, you know, a, a much better, um, a much better experience and a much better uh, platform for them to develop on. So that's where we are. Um, I just want to talk about hooks for a second. Uh, Ripple supported hooks in the beginning. You know, we provided funding. We were publicly supportive of XRPL Labs. Um, we we were excited to see it proposed as an amendment to mainnet. Many developers at Ripple, including Mayuka, Scott Dieterman, um, have looked at the code uh, at Hennis, uh, presented demos at Apex. Um, we've always thought it was interesting. I've always thought it was interesting. I've always said so. Um, my hesitation was around the size and scope and issues like data congestion, transaction fee stability. Um, and I also want to say that there were some miscommunications between all parties involved. Um, there, there was a little bit of a fiasco with the PR um, because the PR was submitted in a way that's not how we usually do PRs and we should have seen that, we didn't. We, we were kind of, we were reviewing it as if it was intended to, go, to be included in mainnet sort of immediately, which it wasn't ready for. And um, I don't know, it's just unfortunate that things didn't go you know, as well as they could have and there was friction that I think was completely unnecessary. Um, I just wanna thank everybody who's contributed with good intentions and just say that it's kind of, it's just kind of sad the way that worked out. Um, I think we can learn a lot from looking at Zahao. So Hooks is implemented on Zahao. It's running live. It's handling real money. And we've been taking a close look. That mitigates the risk. You know, obviously, it didn't break everything. You know, that, you know it's not just that. But also, like, we can see how it functions in, a, in the real world. Um, it is a gigantic piece of code. It is, it is enormous. And um, I'm very impressed with what XRPL Labs has been able to do, the integration with native features by emitting transactions, which is like a very simple way to accomplish something that would otherwise be very complicated. It has a nice API for, for accessing ledger data, which is you know, something smart contracts need to do. And it has a good design for minimizing the amount of data that needs to be stored on chain. Um, 
it's not a great solution, but that is not their fault. You know, they, they have to, they have to fit it. They, you're basking a square peg into a round hole. The ledger was not really designed to small, the XRPL ledger, ledger was not designed to store smart contract data. And they did a very good job of making the best of what they had. And that's probably going to be good enough for some time. Obviously we could implement a whole new data storage service for the XRP ledger. That's a huge job. Um, but hooks prove that you don't need to do that. You can have something that's functional and usable. Um, make some engineering trade-offs it's not perfect nothing's going to be for you know nothing's going to be perfect without having to go through that big job of building a storage service just for smart contracts so very impressive um and i think also it's a proof that programmability can work on an xrpl like chain and again talking to orchestra and Taku and others convinced me that the the benefits and the needs outweigh the potential drawbacks especially if we can go slowly and i think that's the challenge for us to find the right piece um, is it all of hooks? Is it part of hooks? Is it something smaller than hooks? It's got to be a platform we can build off of. It's got to be enough to enable real world use cases and it's got to minimize the risk. So, um, so we're talking about this now because we wanted to be transparent and, you know, we didn't want to come out of the blue to the community with a fully baked design proposal. Um, first of all, that would not have taken into account what people want. And honestly, we're just not, we're just not that smart. We, we only way we know what people want is when they tell us. And so the feedback is incredibly valuable. We try to be transparent early, which means that when we change our minds, you're going to hear us change. Like, you know, these are, these are not commitments. These are intentions. Um, you're going to hear us say, Hey, we don't believe that anymore. Hey, we heard what you said. Sometimes people get mad because we don't listen to us. And then people get mad when we listen to them because we didn't listen to them sooner. Um, we're never going to be perfect. You know, um, we're going to make mistakes. I, I wish we could we could do better, but you know, it is what it is. We're not trying to tell other people what to do. We're not trying to unilaterally change the ledger. We're trying to come up with a proposal that will get smart contracts on mainnet um, that that works for everybody, and um, and we, we want you guys to contribute. So those are our priorities. That's what we're going to be trying to focus on. Um, I'd like to hear, you know, how people feel like maybe that maybe some people are going to be like, oh, well, then I'm going to work on something else. Or maybe some people have some ideas for things that we could work on or have use cases that are important to them that we can make, try to make sure that those use cases are doable. Um, we need everybody working on, you know, different things. You don't have to focus on what we're focusing on <clears throat> and something that we don't think is a good idea might be a good idea. Don't let us discourage you, you know. We'd love to work with the labs team and others. If they're, you know, anyone who's willing to work with us, we're, we're, we're super happy to do it if people want to be constructive. So that's it. Something that can glue together the existing building blocks, something that can implement business logic on the XRP ledger, something that can enhance the XRP ledger's capabilities while maintaining its core strengths, baby steps. We want something that can be live in months, not years. We want something that's, that's, that's relatively safe, as safe as we can get it. And that's a platform to build off of. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mayuka, my, my colleague, and um, then we'll uh, take some questions from you guys. Thank you.